And like say a terrible card that is still sold today, most of you are probably jumping to the GT210, and some of you probably the GT1030. But today we've got a hold of the next tier down. This right here is the NVIDIA GeForce 8400 GS Revision 3 DDR2 variant non-passive. Which sounds like a long name, and could be something that you could find confusing or misleading, and trust me, that's essentially the whole point of these cards, and something you'll actually understand later on in the video. Our card here has some pretty riveting specifications that rival only the best of potatoes. Being based on the same G218 architecture as the GT210, but that's something that can change depending on which variant of the card you actually get. We've been quite lucky to get one with a whole 16 CUDA cores, 256MB of DDR2 RAM, and currently it sounds like a powerhouse. However, this isn't exactly a power heavy card, no, it's more of a display adapter, which I'm pretty sure most of you already know, and does have rather low power requirements. I paid just £3 for this card today, but the price doesn't really matter. What matters is why this legitimate potato exists, why it was sold for about 40 to £60 for so bloody long, and why it's as misleading as I said earlier. So, let's dive into where things begin to get weird. See, we've all heard of the NVIDIA GeForce 8400 GS. Yes, I have to use the full name because it's still confusing to anyone that wouldn't know it. It's a bit of a potato with a bit of a bad reputation, but as a display adapter, it was relatively okay. It was poor compared to some of the options on the market, but the thing is, it had NVIDIA's backing and some decent drivers to go along with it. But see, the issue isn't with it being a display adapter, or with its pricing, or with it being whatever the hell else it was. No, the issue is with its confusing naming scheme. Hmm, where have we seen that before? I don't know, the GT1030? The GT730? Plenty other low-end display adapters that seem to have multiple variants of the same bloody card. But this was before something like that would actually get proper amounts of coverage in the tech press. No, this card right here has three main revisions, with the one you'll be seeing today being the final one. However, the story starts way back in April of 2007 with revision 1. It's based on a G86 chip and it was reviewed as a bit of a potato, but it was an alright display adapter. However, before 2007 was up, they released a revision 2 with an updated graphics core to something a bit more power efficient, something that will work on laptops where it was also sold inside them. And then, out of nowhere, three years later, they bought the 8400 GS out of retirement again, with the revision we're seeing here today, this time being based on the same architecture, as I said earlier, as the GT210. So what you end up with is three cards all being sold alongside each other, but that doesn't sound too bad, you know, giving a card a die shrink, continuing to sell it with better power efficiency, you know, very similar performance. But that's not the case, these cards are not all equal. Okay, so we've got the basics out of the way, and now you actually understand that there's three different versions of this card, so we're going to get a little bit more in depth. See, the main release of this card I've made into a little fact file, as it's the easiest way for me to actually explain this to you. And as you can see, it had 16 CUDA cores, only used DDR2, and it's what you'd expect from a display adapter. But remember that confusing refresh we got before Christmas? Well, that's where the whole weird, confusing part of this puzzle starts, as they cut down the amount of CUDA cores to 8, that's right, 8 CUDA cores, and also made it available with DDR2, DDR3, and GDDR3 memory so you could buy a literal turd with high-speed graphical RAM. Either way, this was more of a cost-saving measure as well as a power-focused release, but either way, still a bit of a scummy move as there was no naming indication and most people buying these, well, they had no real idea what version they were actually buying. And then, of course, three years later, just to add to the confusion, you could buy the Revision 3 with either 16 or 8 CUDA cores, DDR2 or DDR3 memory, and absolutely no real way of telling if you were getting a Revision 1, Revision 2, Revision 3, if you didn't understand the tech specs you had no idea what RAM you were getting, and forget about getting any type of GDDR memory on these later releases as they stopped doing that, and those seem to be quite rare to find nowadays anyway. But I reckon this puts into perspective why this was such a misleading and hated release. Just trying to research all these variants shows how many there are, and honestly, it's just insane that this card continued for so long, with so many different variants, all at the same time. In fact, just to confirm how many variants of this card there were, I once again turn to the budget builds community, as you'll never find such a great hive of hate towards terrible low-budget releases than those who have been stuck using them for years. 
and you guessed it, a lot of people had some stories to tell me about the 8400GS. A lot of them having been misled into what they are actually purchasing, with most people just hating the card in all its forms. The people with anything positive to say about this sorry excuse of a card were people using it for a display adapter that bought it for that exact purpose. There were people that have had the card catch fire, there were people that have been missold the card because they were told the number was higher, but no one was really touching on how different all our cards were, with all of them having some random configuration from vendor to vendor, with some people even getting the same vendor but completely different specifications. But today, with our middle of the road final release variant, just how well is it going to perform? We're going to be testing things on my main PC, so don't worry, everything is going to be down to this absolute turd being a complete limit to us in every way possible. So, let's start us off with CSGO, which is running the latest version of the game, but even with the lowest settings, shows that you are not in for a good time. I was going to try and run an older version of the game, however that option has been removed, so it's not something I'll be testing at the moment, but I'd like to get around to it at a later date. However, either way you look at it, this was not a great experience on the card, but still something worth testing. Either way, I'd hate to imagine how it would fare with the lower end variants of this card, with 8 CUDA cores, but yeah, this was really something to behold, as I know some people were actually playing this game on this card very recently. GTA 5 is a game I always like to test because it does actually run really nicely on low end hardware, and I thought with such a little VRAM this card was just going to do nothing at all, but it did end up running. It was still an admirable 17 FPS average, which is pretty impressive for a DirectX 10 level turd, but still it wasn't up to the level of the 9500 GT we tested a few weeks back which had half the VRAM as this, but that card it was indeed more powerful. So yes, GTA 5 sort of runs, just not very well. Simple titles like Minecraft, which is running here with Optifine and a HD resolution, do tend to run really well. Games like Minecraft really don't care for VRAM very much, so that's hardly a limit at all, so what we're seeing here is entirely the performance of 16 CUDA cores. I remember nearly being caught out by this card by seeing the benchmarks in a game like this and thinking, wow, if it can run this in HD, maybe it can run some other things. But this really is the outlier. I mean, this is a card that most people are going to have in their HP or Dell SFF systems, and honestly you can't complain when you're seeing performance like this, where the card is in its element. However, what it did do okay with is Crisis, and that ran about as well as CSGO, which isn't really what you want to be hearing when you've just seen the benchmark, but hey, with some very low settings in a nice and low resolution, the game did indeed show some promise and could even see 30fps frame rates when nothing else was going on, but that's not really what Crisis is about. Either way, it can run Crisis, just don't expect much better performance than a PowerPoint slideshow with your hand down on the arrow keys. It wasn't great in heavy scenes. Driving an old school Opal around in spin tires saw very poor performance. I was told this game would run on an old Intel HD chip, and maybe that just goes to show how even the old Intel HDs are very much more powerful than this little card, which kind of voids you buying them for your little SFF PCs as I said earlier. But even with very low settings and a very low resolution, it is not what I would call a good experience. It's running semi-okay in certain instances where there's literally nothing but brown on screen, but it wasn't a pretty game either way. And for a sort of lightweight title, it's not ideal, is it? Mountain Blade Warband tends to run really nicely on the card, admittedly with very low settings. I probably don't have the best footage to show you, given that I was also testing out this rather unique mod of the game. But either way, other than the animations bugging out because the settings I were using were so low, it did remain playable the entire time. Increasing the settings up would make the game completely unplayable, likely down to the very little VRAM on the card. So either way, very low settings is your best bet to see anything worth playing. Civ 5, even though a strategy game was not playable on the card. At first I thought it was maybe me loading a save that was too far into the late game which can be very intensive even on a good system. But no, even with the lowest settings and a brand new game it was certainly not something I'd want to play. Yes it's a strategy game so you could probably get away with it, but with the input lag it causes, it's just not good even for those simple titles like this, and it's not exactly an easy game to play on this card. And just a reminder this card was sold well into this game's release date. 
Emulation is alright, but the latest you'll be running is Dolphin in a lower resolution than a real GameCube. People keep suggesting this GPU for emulation in certain conversations I've noticed, but really unless we're talking about the NES or SNES consoles, really you're better off just using integrated graphics usually, or just using your mobile phone. Honestly for anything newer than that, this card was pretty downright terrible. Sure it has the advantage of being cheap and easily available, but let's be honest here, you'll get far better performance than this for not much money, and if you've got a remotely modern processor, the iGPU is going to be about 5 times better. See, this card can run a lot of older titles fine in near HD resolutions or 720p resolutions for a lot of them. However, when I say this, I'm talking about things from the early 2000s, as mentioned by the community earlier. The issues come from the fact that this card was pushed onto a lot of people by retailers who sold them under the premise of a higher number meaning better. It's one of the reasons why it sold for so long, as people being recommended these over the same card, the GT210, despite them being the same card, because the 8000 is a bigger number than the 200, so clearly it's better. This is genuinely something we've seen. Sure, a lot of them ended up in servers and small offices, and that's where they're still being sold new today, because honestly, it's easier just to stick in the same graphics card and not have to worry about drivers if you just want to get someone dual monitors. But when you go back a few years, you can find places like Best Buy and Maplin selling these cards brand new in the box, which is where a lot of the hate comes from, as people were buying these things brand new up until very recently. You guys saw just how poorly this card holds up with newer titles, and it just can't run them, and it was sold along the side them. It's just not a good card. If you notice those temperatures I was getting, you'll be thinking, oh, Budget Builds is going to be doing some overclocking on this card. And you'd be right, of course I'm going to take the utmost advantage of the fact my card has a fan. But my card does not actually clock very high, in fact a lot of these cards don't tend to clock very high. And the limit I have is less to do with the power of the card, but more down to the lack of any real VRAM. The VRAM would just crash no matter how high I could get it to clock, and even with the increased performance we could see a few FPS here or there in some older titles, but it's not really enough to say that you can overclock this card into a good experience like some people claim you can. Instead, you'll just get rid of the one thing this card can do, which is run on low power, as it tends to eat through quite a bit more power when you're pushing some more clocks. Either way, it's just not worth it, so do with that information what you will. In conclusion, a confusing disappointment, and really, I'm not sure how to feel. The defense of it being a display adapter really falls down when I could see the card lagging around the desktop in certain instances, However, with plugins, you can also do things like run HD YouTube videos, and for running in a media server just playing standard videos, it works absolutely fine. But still, even as a display adapter, it's not great here in 2020. Mostly sold on the premise of its CUDA core technology, and that it was also the cheapest DX10 graphics card you could get a hold of for a long time, it's not that great today. DX10 is a limit, the fact it's just confusing is a limit, but today, please just avoid this card. I've even enjoyed finding out why this card was a bit of a misleading release, as not many people tend to lean into how it was released, which is honestly the most interesting part about it. Really, that's more interesting to me than the benchmarks, is how this thing came to be this weird amalgamation of three different chips in multiple different combinations. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Good night. So, not what I was aiming to be much of a lengthy video, but just something to cover the interesting and sort of weird history of this 8400 GS. Also, I love that I got one with Frobot the Robot on the front for anyone that actually remembers who he is. Anyway, you can always like and subscribe for more, and I'll catch you in the next one.